Well, hello, everyone. Um, we want to welcome you to a special live stream. Of course, I want to say good evening to those of you who are in the evening time zone. Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Of course, with us here, a very dear brother and a famous theologian, uh, I would say apologist, a polemist, a scholar. And uh, if you've been really watching anything uh, lately concerning the uh, historical criticism of Islam in general, uh, the name of Dr. J. Smith will pop up on your screen immediately. So I am honored, of course, uh, for this friendship and this collaboration. And we've been doing a lot of things together. And today, uh, we, uh, I asked Dr. Smith if he can join me to give you a quick recap on some of the things that he's been doing, we've been doing together, any uh, uh, you know, new discoveries related to the historical criticism of Islam, any new work uh, that he's working on and anything we're planning on doing together as well. And uh, with that in mind, I want to welcome our dear brother, uh, Dr. Jay. Welcome, brother. Thank you. Good to be here. So, uh, Jay, we've been doing a lot of this, of course, uh, uh, the book, the man, the place, uh, you, you know, and all these kind of components. But uh, it seemed like, you know, every time we do a video series, there is always a new component, something that uh, you know, you came across, someone from the research team came across, and uh, it, it's been highlighting uh, some of the major issues with what we call the standard Islamic narrative, nicknamed as SIN, S-I-N. Now, uh, could you kindly just, let's start with this. Could you explain to people, because I see that some new ones joining us today, what do we mean by SIN or the standard Islamic narrative? Yeah, in some ways, it's, it's a tongue-in-cheek acronym. Uh, that we borrowed from uh, Dr. Yasser Qadi. Dr. Yasser Qadi is, uh, by most, mo I think by most people would consider him the world's leading authority on what we know as the Kira'at. The Kira'ats are the, the Ahruf. These are the readings uh, that we discovered. I didn't discover them. It was actually, well, I knew about them, but I didn't discover the modern ones. It was our good colleague, uh, Hatun Tash. You know her, I know her. Uh, she was on my team in England when I was there, and uh, I, I helped train her up for the Speaker's Corner down there at Hyde Park in London. And she accidentally came across about four or five of these different Qurans, these different Arabic Qurans, which are the readings, the different readings of the Quran, uh, in Arabic, all in Arabic, and they're all over a thousand years old. Now, the books we have in our hands today aren't over a thousand, but they started to appear. They started to be created. They were starting to be written uh, over a thousand years in the 8th century, 9th century, and 10th century. Now, even when I say that, 8th, 9th, and 10th, I now have to smile because we don't have any one of their original manuscripts. We don't have any manuscript by Ibn Kathir or uh, by Hafs or Anasim. Uh, we don't have any, uh, even by Awesome himself or Kasai or Kalun. I mean, these these names just kind of drip out of your mouths. Where they're well known names. She came across six or seven of them while she was in Morocco uh, doing some training there for people. Just wanted to get one Arabic Quran, and when the guy behind the counter said, "Well, which one do you want?" And he started naming. I have Hafs. I have Warish. I have Kalun. I have Kasai. I have. You know, she said, "Hold on a minute. I thought there was only one Quran. I thought that this was only this is something that I is." Taught, you know, yay high to a grasshopper. Every Muslim knows there's only one Quran. Uh, there's not one word, not one letter, not even a dot that has been changed in the last 1400 years. Because if you have one word, just one word, or even one letter that is changed in the Quranic text, it's no longer inimitable. It's no longer eternal. And this is the claim the Quran has made. This is the claim every Muslim makes. We never make this claim about the Bible. We would never make these kind of claims. But Muslims will. They have to. In order to shut down the Bible, they have to make this claim because we have done our homework on the, our Bible. We know exactly where the manuscripts are. We know exactly what was in the original manuscript. We know we can pretty much reproduce our biblical text, 99.9% .9 of it, just by looking at the manuscript evidence, looking at the Greek manuscript evidence, 5,800 Greek manuscripts, 10,000 Latin Vulgates, 19,000 other manuscripts in 11 different languages. You compare them, put them all together, you're coming up with around 24,000 manuscripts just by comparing them, 
you could pretty well know what 99.9%. Now, are they all early? No, they're not. We never made the claim that they're all early. What is important is that they come from different parts of the world and they come from different languages written by different authors, but that's just the manuscript evidence. Uh, we also have the what we call the uh, lectionaries. These are the uh, the every day, uh, every Sunday in church, they would do these readings straight out of scripture called lectionaries. And they were, we have about 2,000, 135 of them just from the 6th century alone. That's 100 years before Islam, 100 years before the Quran. So these all predate the Quran. And you that's completely different genre, not the manuscript evidence, a completely different genre used as liturgy in the churches all over the Middle East. We can look at those and compare them with the 24,000 manuscripts. So we've got the manuscript evidence. We've got the lectionary evidence. And then we've got the early church fathers' quotations. The early church fathers' quotations are these disputes that they had in the second, first, second, third, up until the fourth century. They would have people that were coming into the church. Many of them were Gnostics who did not believe that God could take on bodily form. They were confronting the church fathers. And so the church fathers, rather than debate them theologically, they would just write letters and they would quote verbatim, verse after verse after verse, taken straight out of the scripture. And those have been retained today. They are uh, they are written on papyrus. Many of them have been found in these, these pits, these uh, trash heaps like Oxyrhynchus in Egypt. Probably thousands have been found in these trash heaps where books were thrown out, many of these lectionary, I'm sorry, these early church fathers' quotations written in letters were then made into paper mache masks later on. And now they've bought up those masks and they've un, uh, been able to uh, reduce them to back to their original papyrus form or parchment form, mostly papyrus form, and they're able to take them and read them. And we have 86,000 of those that we now have access to. 86,000 of these early church fathers' quotations. Now, are they early? No. 36,000 of them are early, though. That's what's interesting. And those 36,000 early church fathers' quotations, all before the 4th century. So that means before the manuscripts, before the Sinaiticus, which is 4th century, before the uh, Vaticanus, which is 4th century, before the Alexandrinus, which is 5th century, known as the three metropolitan codices. Those are the complete New Testament manuscripts that we have on. They're all in Greek, and that's why they are the earliest complete manuscripts. But these early church fathers quotations predate that. And they're completely genre, separate from that. They're not written on parchment. They're not written on vellum, as these metropolitan codices are. These are written on papyrus, which disintegrates, but they've been preserved because they were made into masks. Now, as unpacking them and breaking down the masks and now putting them out and looking at them, we can read them and we can look at them, just these 36,000. Let me give you an example of the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is probably the best one amongst them because the Gospel of John, by looking at these early church fathers' quotations from before the 4th century, so that's before 300 AD, they can reproduce every verse, every word of the Gospel of John except for 11 sentences. Except for 11 sentences. Ooh, two, 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 two. Can you see what we're talking about? That's the treasure trove we have with the Bible. We have so much with the Bible. So we ask the same questions. We say, listen, we've got so many thousands of manuscripts. We've got so many, we've got 2,000 lectionaries. We have 36,000 quotations that predate the fourth century. We can reproduce the entire Gospel of John except for 11 verses. What do you have, Muslims? Because you're the one that makes the claim that yours is preserved eternally. You're the one that makes the claim. And it's not just you. It's the Quran itself that makes this claim in chapter 85. In chapter 85, verse 21 and 22, it's the Quran that says, for the, talks about these preserved tablets. Look at every one of the exegetes on Quran, chapter 85, verse 21 and 22. Look at Ibn Kathir, you name any of Suyuti, Baidawi, Zamakshadi. Look at all the the. the uh, uh, exegetes as they exegete that scripture and what do they say these this verse these two verses are referring to the eternal tablets the Quran was never created it has always existed and that's why chapter 85 is there so Muslims when they make this claim they're not making it up it's the Quran that makes this claim but more than that the Quran continues and makes other claims about this preserved tablet this uh, this this Quran that is eternal that has never been created it says that nobody can change it not one word can be changed in chapter 10 
verse 15 in chapter 28 uh in chapter i'm sorry uh 10 verse 15 chapter uh i think it's in chapter 18 verse 27 it says for no man no man no human you or me nobody can change it because once we change one word once man changes one letter it's no longer eternal it's no longer preserved it's no longer inimitable and how is it that if no man can change it well because allah himself preserves it and that's in chapter 15 verse 9 in chapter 15 verse 9 of the Quran, for allah will preserve it allah will guard it so if allah guards it that means nobody can have come close to it and change one letter one word one dot or one uh one vowel or one uh, diacritic mark if that is the case then of course muslims have to have to come up with some type of proof for that and so we've always asked them haven't we al-fadi you and i have gone but we've done 60 episodes just on how the quran was created it's actually more than that. I think it's pushing 70, brother. But yeah, it's about a book called, um, uh, you know, Creating the Quran. And we're on, we're, we're just halfway through the number 40, right? On your, on your site. I haven't even yet put it on my site yet. And here we're asking this very same question. Since you say it's uncreated, we're going to prove and we're going to show you using what Dr. Stephen Shoemaker has come up with to show it is full of creation. There is an enormous amount of manipulation. There is an enormous amount of accretions and deletions and corruptions all the way through its creation. And here's what's cra crazy about it. And this is stuff we have yet to even introduce yet. We're now looking at these kirats, these kirats. See, the kirats are probably the most devastating amongst all of, of this preservation argument. The reason why is that you don't just have one or two or three or four and there's the book right there creating the quran by dr uh stephen shoemaker folks get that book everybody get it in your library you need to get it because he has done a a wealth he's brought together all the best uh, research on the quran and has put it into one book quoting scholar after scholar this is not just summation this is not just hyperbole uh, uh, exaggeration of things he thinks or his opinion in fact he's very careful not to put his opinion there he is writing what other scholars have found and then he's saying okay let's open it. what does this mean if this scholar is saying here what does that mean for the creation of the Quran? What does that mean for the text of the Quran? What does that mean for this claim that the Quran has never had had no human intervention? And so that's why that book's such a great book. But what's fascinating on this area of Kirat, he doesn't really get into Kirat very much on this. We get into it. You and I have done this. And amazing reason why we get into it is because we have been at the forefront of this because of Hatun Tosh. Thank you know, thank God for that five foot two inch girl. Uh, that she has destroyed the Quran single-handedly because she found 26 of these back in two th by 2016 just by going to places like jordan she went to yemen and she went up uh, way over to morocco and she just started collecting them and you can collect them in the bookstores i have nine of them right up there take a look right up there those are all kirats nine different kirats nine different um what we call different readings now hold on a minute and this is something that's coming out you have not heard this yet uh, and this is something that we're going to talk about. You've heard me say 10 kirats. That means seven by Ibn Mujahid and three by Al-Jazari, right? Jazari. Uh, seven from 10th century, 936, that were chosen. Chosen, not written, but chosen by Ibn Mujahid. And then another three that were chosen by Al-Jazari in the 15th century, 1429. So 10 that were so, uh, seven that were chosen about roughly 300 years after Muhammad, if Muhammad had existed, and then another three that were chosen by Al Jazari 800 years after Muhammad existed. So you can see there's a problem right there. So how can you choose different Qurans? These are the creme de la creme, these are the 10 major ones, right? But from every 10, there are two students. Am I correct? Yeah, they are, they are the transmitters. You have the reader and has two transmitters. Right there, you have 20 already just using that count. Well, actually, uh, you're, you're right. You actually, you have uh, uh, you have 14 plus another six. But here's the fascinating thing. These are known as riwayats or rawis. Rawis for plural riwayats. You can probably say it much better than I can in the Arabic because I'm desecrating your language. My, my, uh, forgive me for that. So these students are known as rawis or riwayats. Now, here's something you've never heard before. That's not all. Every one of those riwayats had two students themselves known as tariks. Ooh, there go the balloons. 
See, even, even my computer is excited about this. I didn't do that. The, the computer decides it wants to celebrate. 10 for every one of these rewires. How many rewires did we just got done saying? 20, right? That's right. So now you have another 40, right? Two for each. 40 plus 20 meets 60 plus the original 10. That meets 70, right? And then we have just now found out that for every one of those tariks, there's another whole genre of tariks of two of each of those tariks. So that's a fourth generation of, of what uh, readers or you might say students. So that makes 40 plus two. That's another 80. So add that up. 80 plus 40. You can see right now we're already we're already getting over 100 right there. 120 plus the other original uh, 30. So 120 plus 30, 150 different Qurans we're up to now. And, and let me add something, uh, Dr. J, because I, I, I can tell that uh, a Muslim is going to say, well, thank you guys for saying this. You just proved to us what we call the chain of transmission. Absolutely not. It actually destroys it simply because there are so many errors, so many different ways of reading the Quran. If it came really from one source and you have that many eyewitness, we won't be talking about different qiraat in the first place. Yeah, and this is the beauty of this whole thing. People say it doesn't change a thing. These are just pronunciation differences. You say potato, I say potato. You say tomato, I say tomato, potato, potato. You know that famous song. That's not what's happening here. These are not just vowelization. If it was just vowelization, you know, a dhamma or a kasra change with a fata, if that's all it was, Fine, then we're just talking about the same word, but different pronunciation. You pronounce it different than I, but it's the same word. No, this changes the word completely in almost every case. I don't want to say every case, but in almost every case. And we're going through that. I mean, when we held up, when we held up these um, 26 in 2016, so we're talking about eight years ago, we held these up for the first time. What do you think we did right after that? Even while we were on the ladder, and Muslims haven't paid attention to this. We then held up slide after slide. We were holding them up, but we had to cellophane them because we knew they were going to try to tear them. And you can see right on film, they grabbed them from our hands to tear them. Because what we did, we put the huffs and we put the wash next to each other. Just two. We took two out of the 26 that we had. We just do two. And we did verse by verse, sentence by sentence, word by word comparison. Looking at them in Arabic. This is not the translation. We weren't looking at the translate. We just compared the word by word. And you saw, you saw there's a dot above making a nun. And then this over here, it's a dot below making it a B. So from an N to a B, that changes the word. But not only does it change the word, it changes the meaning. Not only does it change the meaning, in some cases, it changes the theology. In some cases, it changes the doctrine. In other cases, it changes the practice. This has wholesale changes. And this is something that Muslims do not want me to say or you to say or anybody else. Say. They don't want us to look at these. They don't want us to look at these changes. That's what we're doing now. We're now unpacking every one of them. Now, Dr. Shadi Nasser is the world's leading authority on this. One of my students in my class is the one that has found a hundred of these 150 different Gira'ats and Riwayats and Tariqs. So there's three genre. Gira'ats, which are the readings, or Akhru, if you want to interchange them there. Then you have the Riwayats, which are the, the associate, uh, these are the students. And then the students of those students are the Tariqs, which is, an, again, another f common word in Arabic. Which and What is the translation for Tariq? How would you translate it? There is, uh, I mean, I, uh, what I'm hearing you say, either history or way, basically. Way. That's it's the way, it's not the history. Yeah, okay. It's a different way of saying, uh, this, uh, if, of not even saying the same thing. And that's the fascinating thing about this. Doctor, uh, we, we have uh, someone that's working with, I can't give you his name, I'm not permitted to, but you know, he's a good friend of both of ours, uh, who's working with Dr. Shadi Nasser. And uh, he is now finding, he said, listen, there's more than a hundred. There's we found ninety three thousand differences between these thirty, just the first thirty that we've looked at. He is now saying it's way more than it's already over a hundred thousand that he has found. So we're just going to sit back and wait to see what you know how many we're coming up with. So we're talking about tens of thousands of difference, and every one of them changes the meaning. Every one of them changes the word, which already right there shuts down this whole notion that the Quran has been preserved perfectly absolutely eradicates that we've not even had a chance to collect the 150 that we now know out there i would imagine many of them have been destroyed they, we won't be able to find all 150 we've already found 37 
Uh, and I know that we're going to be looking for more. Now we're going to be looking for even more because we want to at least get at least 80 of them. If we can get 80 of them and preserve them before the Muslims. See, the Muslims are going to buy them up and, and, and destroy them because they don't want the evidence out there. The difficulty is they should have done this a thousand years ago. They should have done this. Well, more than that, they should have done this at the time of Ibn Mujahid. Because what was happening, according to Dr. Shadi Nasir, many of these riwayats had many students. Let me just give you um, Asim. Asim. Who is the was the Kirat or the 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 teacher of Hafs, which is Hafs is the one that we use today here in the West. This is the most popular one. Hafs an Asim. We always call it Hafs an Asim. And so Hafs is the one that we have from Kufa. He died in 796. His his teacher was also from Kufa. But here's the funny thing: he wasn't the only student. There were 91 students under Asim. Only he and Kalun were choos chosen. Two of them out of the 91. What about the other 89? What happened to their Qurans? See, we're talking about another 89 Qurans that are no longer, that are missing today. Well, that's one reason why Al-Shatabi in the 12th century and then Al-Jazari Jazari in the 15th century had to come and choose some even more, had to choose many more to accommodate this, to, uh, to ameliorate this, because there were so many from which to choose from. So that's one reason we're now going and we're um, unpacking this. Now, I'm not doing this research. I'm just communicating it so the world can understand it, because the people who are doing this research don't are doctorates. They're in. They're. Uh, they're. They all are academics. They are in. They have chairs in universities. Uh, they have to protect those chairs. They cannot say what they're finding, so they're feeding us the material so that we can use it. And that's why, Al Fadi, what you're doing here on this channel in City International, and what I'm doing on Fander Films, is to take this academic work that Muslims will not do. They won't do this academic work. They won't actually go and show you how different these, these are. All they'll do is say, these are no different. They don't change any doctrine. They don't change any theology. We're showing and we're shutting that down real quickly. And we're not saying that we believe they change the doctrine. We're letting you look word by word, phrase by phrase, sentence by sentence, verse by verse, and say, you decide, are, are these two different sentences? Are these two different meanings? You decide that as the people who are watching. So we're letting the people come to that decision. And it's at categorically across the board. Everybody is now realizing that what Islam has been telling us and what Muslims have been telling us, not for 1,400 years, not even for 1,300 years, only for about 1,000 years, has been absolutely lies. These have been lie upon lie upon lie. And we're shutting down that line. Now, that's just one area of, uh, of, uh, of, of research. Um, you want to come back to me on it before we go into some other areas that we're also engaged? Yes, in? And, and I want to just affirm what you're saying. I don't know if you're aware of this, but um, I'm going to read something right now uh, that might astonish people. It was back in July 20th in the year 2020. So the year in the COVID time on a liberal Saudi, basically, website known as Elaf. And uh, there was a Kurdish writer who wrote... Uh, about the fact that the Quran has so many changes that basically these changes today needs to be revisited and needs to be corrected. The changes uh, that the author basically quoted another blogger uh, or a journalist by the name of Ahmed Hashim, who is a Saudi actually. And Ahmed Hashim said the following. In his article, his article was uh, was published in January 10th, 2020, before COVID, basically. And here's what it says. The title was Amending the Quran. Notice, Amending the Quran. In other words, the Saudi author is saying, or journalist, we need to amend the Quran. He says, the Quran as we know it was written down during the period of the third caliph. Of course, this is what the traditional Islamic narrative will say. Uthman bin Affan. Using the Uthmanic script, which is named after him, most Muslims believe that this version of the Quran, which was written in the 37th year after the Hijra, meaning basically 27 years after the death of Muhammad, 10 years, including the migration from Mecca to Medina. That's why it's 37 years. Look what he's saying. He's saying, however... The Quran in its present form contains errors of spelling, syntax, and grammar. It is estimated that there are about 2,500 such mistakes. They were made by the committee tasks 
with compiling the Quran and include the addition or omission of letters in some words or substitutes. And then he goes on, Jay, to say, Uthman is not God. He's not inspired by God. He's just a human being like the rest of us. So why can't we today revisit the Quran and amend the Quran? It is amazing to read something like this in a Saudi newspaper by a Saudi journalist. And you would think he would be basically captured and imprisoned. But no, that's the direction we're taking these days. Well, here's the problem. I mean, just that quote, isn't that amazing that he's making that type of admission? But he's also confusing two things. And this is a common error that many Muslims make. Listen, not just Muslims, everybody makes this error. And that is the Qira'at versus the Razm. You have two, and you know what I'm talking about. Maybe, why don't you unpack what is the Razm and what is the Qira, and what is the difference between the two? Okay, so... The rasm is the structure of the word itself, the letters. When you write like A, B, C, you know, let's let's say the word apple, okay? That's the rasm, the A, the P, the P, the L, the E, that's the rasm. I'm simplifying it because in English it's very simple, but in Arabic, you have it like this as a raw structure, and then you start adding dots, you start adding diacritical marks, and that's where the reading is influenced now. So if the resum is not really dotted or, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, the, the, the markings are not made correctly, or at least the markings are not identical from one reading to the other, and the same word as Dr. Smith mentioned to you could be read differently and the meaning would change completely. Okay. Now, see, you get use the word apple, right? But even your word apple is incorrect because you concluded A and E. The Rosam does not include A and E in Arabic. That's, that's the problem. I love you, Jay. You always have to argue back with me. But that's okay. I was just trying to And this is what people don't realize. Even your example, Apple, or any word that we have in English, we include the vowels along with the consonants. Not so Arabic. So the original 7th century script did not have A or E or I. It didn't have any of those uh, vowels. Those vowels did not exist in the 7th century. Right. The vowel markings in the Arabic, that's correct, were not there initially. Correct. So if I gave you a word and I say P-P-L, what is this word? You wouldn't know. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, You wouldn't know. Word. No, that is the problem right there. My, my name. My name's a little easier because it's almost all consonants. Let's just you. Here's a good one. McDonald's. McDonald's, right? McDonald's would be M-C- M C D N L D. Now, does it have a M A in between? Is it McDonald's or McDonald's or McDonald's or McDonald's? You could put where your vowels. So one of the problems was they didn't they weren't able to read the text. And back in the seventh century, there were only 16 of these consonants. Only 16. Today, there are now 28 in what you read. Because of those five dots that were added. And then the vowels that were three dot that three vowels that were added after that. So the five dots were in created or were started to be created in the eighth and were finished and we think were canonized by the ninth century. The vowels continued to be changed because you have then the short, then you have even long vowels that were that continue up until the tenth century. So it wasn't only in the tenth century that you could really read this this text that you had in front of you. But here is the problem. And even this Saudi Arabian was, isn't thinking this through. And the reason why is because they haven't looked at the earliest manuscripts. The earliest manuscripts, which is the top copy. just a traditional Muslim, obviously. Obviously. And see, we are looking at the earliest manuscripts. And that includes the top copy from I I Istanbul, the Samarkand from Uzbekistan, uh, the Ma'il, which is in London, the Petropolis, which is there in uh, Paris. You have the Husseini manuscript, which is in Cairo, and then the Sana manuscript, which is in uh, which is uh, in, in Sana in Yemen. Those are the six major ones. There are another four that have been added to begin and others that come after. But those are the first six. Uh, remember I said the Bible has, we have uh, 5,800 Greek manuscripts and 10,000 Latin Vulgates. They only have six to go on compared to 1,800 that we have. They have six to go on that are the earliest. Now, I want to be careful because not all this uh, uh, 
5,800 or early or not all of uh, the 10,000 Latin Vulgates or the 19,011 languages are early. But nonetheless, if you have these six, see, he's not even going to those six. And that's where Dan Brubaker's research has been so uh, instrumental and so damaging because Dan Brubaker decided to do that in 2010. He was the first to ever do that. Here you have an American living in America, getting his doctorate at Rice University, the first man in history in 1,400 years to actually go and take and look at every one of the manuscripts line by line by line by line and looking and reading it for the first time, the manuscripts. Because remember what that guy said in his, uh, the, the fellow said in his, uh, uh, in his article, we, why don't we go back and why don't we go and recreate the crown again and make it one Quran? In order to do that, all you need to do is go back to the original manuscript. Do what Dr. Dan Brubaker did. That's what he got his doctorate for. He took four years to look at the, the six manuscripts and it added another four on top of that. By 2014, he had found 800 different words. These are not kidats. These are not dot, but dots and vowels. There are no dots and vowels in any of these. These are consonantal differences. These are rhythm differences. This changes the meaning completely. And you cannot, in this case, you cannot say, oh, this has nothing, this only has to do with pronunciation. No, these are completely different sentences when you change the, the, the script, the script, I'm sorry, when you change the consonants. So that is by far the most damaging. And that's why everybody is trying to shut down Dr. Dan Brubaker. And that's why uh, uh, Dr. Tayyip al wrote an entire book against Dr. Brubaker, uh, basically saying, you don't know what you're talking about. It's called refutation, which is really not a refutation anyway. It was done, uh, probably he was influenced to write something just to respond to this damage and discovery. And he didn't even de deal with what Dr. Brubaker was claiming. That's what's fascinating. Uh, well, you can always find refutations of everybody's work if you just take one or two examples and then blow it up out of proportion, and calling these nothing more than scribal, scribal errors. No, they weren't scribal errors. These are intentional differences. These are, and in many cases, and see, most of the, much of the material that Dan Brubaker did did not even cover the Husseini manuscript. The Husseini manuscript is by far the most damaging because it is full of hundreds upon hundreds of coverings and coverings and coverings and tapings and tapings and coverings with written over top and coverings not written over top, just left blank. But in every case, every one of those coverings, which are entire sentences, sometimes entire lines, what is left behind now supports this text here, the Hafs Anasim. This one we have here. This is the one that was chosen. And he said, why don't we make one Quran and make it the, the original? Well, that was done in 1924, 100 years ago. Who do you think, what do you think al Husseini al-Haddad was doing in Cairo University? I'm sorry, in Al-Azhar University in Cairo. That's what he did in 1924 because they could not find, they could not standardize the tests for high school students because they were getting 30 different answers on every question about the Quran. That's why they needed Husseini to do that. So that was done 100 years ago. This author that's writing this article needs to go back and look at his own history. And that's why they chose this one here. Now, what they were choosing, choosing was not a consonantal text. They were choosing a kidda text. They were choosing a kidda in ahruf derivation. They were choosing one, which was rather ironic because the one they chose is the one the Ottomans chose. And the reason the, he had to choose that is because the Ottomans controlled all these manuscripts. They owned these manuscripts for 700 years. Remember, since 1300, 1299 is when they came to power. Up until 1924, that 700 period, year period, they controlled the Topkapi, the Samarkand, the Ma'il, the Petropolitanus, the Husseini, and the Sana manuscript. They owned all of them and the other ones be, as besides, and then dispersed them as presents to different peoples and to different uh, countries. And that's why in, by 1924, they were dispersed to seven different areas, six different areas. But they had control over all, all of those manuscripts for 700 years. Who do you think then were the ones that actually censored every one of these texts and corrected them and put insertions and erased them and put another, and sometimes they, in one case like this, uh, this one that he has uh, from the Doha, the, the manuscript in Doha, 
he found uh, 12, nine different times where Allah had to be added to the text. The name Allah had to be added above the line, below the line, to the side of the line. The name of God had to be added to the text. Why do you add God's name there? Well, obviously, because it, had, it, it was missing in the Huff's text. I mean, it's in the Huff's text, but it wasn't in that manuscript. So in this case, in every case, you didn't even need God's name there. It is understood it's talking about God. But because of the fact that the Huff's text had it, they had to then introduce it into the Doha manuscript. So this has been going on for 700 years. This has been going on long before 1924. Many people think that what Dan Brubaker was saying happened in the last 100 years. No, this all happened long before 1924. And it happened since the 1300s. It's been going on. And that's why it's so fascinating when Muslims make, continue to make this claim that the Quran has been well, deserve, uh, well preserved. Now, that's the one thing we're looking at. The other thing we're going to is now we're looking at Muhammad's name. Okay, yeah. Thank yep. you, everybody. And uh, uh, until we meet next time, brother, have a blessed day. God bless you. God bless all of you. Take care, everyone.